This is Transistor.fm. Howdy. I'm Justin, and this is Product People, the podcast focused on great products and the people who make them. And this week, I have Jacob Lenowski on the show. He's the man behind goodui.org, which attracted a ton of attention and over 26,000 subscribers. We're going to talk about why he built it and how all that happened. But first, let me thank a few people who make this show possible. Joe Stump at www.sprint.ly has been a sponsor forever. And basically, Joe's whole idea with building Sprintly is he wanted to bring some transparency to the development process. So instead of development being a kind of a black box where no one knew exactly what was going on, he wanted to make it transparent to the whole company. And that's exactly what Sprintly does. It's project management software built specifically for people building software. You can try it for free, www.sprint.ly, but then you can get 10% off with the coupon code PRODUCTPEOPLETV2013. Next up, are you creating an application that needs charts or dashboard? Fusion Charts is a JavaScript charting solution trusted by developers around the world. They have tons of charts, lots of options. Their charts work across all different platforms. You can download a free trial at fusioncharts.com. And after all that, hey Jacob, how's it going? Hey Justin, thanks for uh, thanks for having me here. Yeah, well, I'm really looking forward to this chat. Now you're you're a fellow Canadian, right? I'm a fellow Canadian working away from uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. So perfect. And what do you do for a living? So I'm a UI designer, and I pretty much specialize in concepting, sketching, kind of early stages that are kind of loosely defined, ambiguous. And then I also work for a bunch of clients, I guess, in North America here, and uh, one being kind of a more long-term contract, which I'm balancing with uh, yeah, some clients in the States as well. So Perfect. And and have you been doing this for quite a while, UI design? It's, uh, yeah, it's been evolving. It's been a career path I've been evolving since high school, uh, specifically probably uh, 96 or so. Wow. Uh, yeah. So you got involved in high school, like... When when was ninety six? Was that tenth grade, eleventh grade? That was probably eleventh, twelfth grade or so. And how did it happen? How did you get involved in the web? Um, so that it's actually uh, the, the the kind of spark was uh, the initiative was my mom <laughs> found a newspaper clipping in a, in a Polish uh, newspaper, a little ad saying looking for a web designer. Right? And and you know with a, with a number, <laughs> and I and I called this guy up, and and uh, this was like before uh, the dot com boom, I guess, or where everyone like was jumping onto buying, purchasing domain names and such. And uh, yeah, this guy had a bunch of <laughs> different domain names and a bunch of other ideas what to do with them. And uh, I just started, you know, doing building different kind of sites for him for like. For, for, for lawyer lawyer listing data, databases uh, stuff like that so so that was your first paying gig was in high school that was the first time yeah and do you remember how much you charged for those first sites you know when you're in high school you don't charge much right uh, yeah <laughs> but but whatever you get is still uh, still perceived as much right so so for uh, as an example one of the first sites I did I think was a couple hundred which took like two or three weeks. And that was like, wow, that was awesome. Yeah, like that seems like so much money. <laughs> That's awesome. But yeah, definitely learning very quickly at that point, you know, when you kind of compare how quickly you learn when you're a teenager versus, uh, you know, someone a bit older, like I guess us in the 30s or so, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a bit more uh, uh, sped up, I guess. Yeah, yeah, you just have way more time to, to focus on that stuff. And time, of course, yeah. Let's kind of fast forward you just launched something called Good UI. When, when did you actually launch that? So Good UI came about um, probably March or April, I think, of this year. So March or April 2013. And w why did you build it? What's the story behind it? So the whole idea behind it was um, to kind of validate, uh, maybe share these kind of intuitive 
uh, gut feelings of, of what you know kind of constituted uh, good user interface design. Um, I guess you know when you when you're working in a profession and and and, and you have a couple of years behind your back, you, you start developing or, or, or falling back on these little principles or, or tips uh, that you kind of use in your work, right? And those kind of accumulate in your in your head, right? And and I started I started jotting them down. Um, you know, there and there, you know, so some are kind of envisioned on your own, but some are heard from a bunch of other people, and you know, on, on the uh, on the web, right? Uh, but started getting trying to get a grasp of, of of those and explicitly kind of write out write them out and and share them when uh, you know with the community. Um, so they're they're kind of hypotheses in a way. So they're not uh, uh, they're not specifically. Uh, like the Ten Commandments, you know, you have to follow this, the golden rules. Um, yeah. They, I, I purposefully left, I, I purposefully used the, the word try in the beginning of each tip. <laughs> yeah. Try, almost almost like that, inspired a little bit by the kind of agile manifesto, which I think uses something like do this over that, I don't know, conversations over documentation as an example, right? Yeah. So, um, so stuff like that. And, and when you launched it, um, like, was your idea that you just wanted to get a bunch of information out to people, or did you think that you might eventually turn this into a product? What was your kind of thinking behind it? Um, I didn't think I could turn it into a product uh, when I was initially doing it. I, maybe, maybe one of the um, the sparks or. or, or uh, thoughts behind it was that if if I could explicitly you know list these good user interface tips and, and share them publicly and if they can get over time somehow maybe validated uh, then maybe I can use that later on in my work or maybe others could use that as well to uh, to refer back to it and and uh, you know, sometimes you have like these situations at work where you're like, oh, should we do this or should we should we have long scrolling pages or should we fit everything above the fold? Uh, and 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 if, if we could kind of if, if if I could kind of validate that a little bit, maybe put some in, uh, later on eventually some numbers behind it and uh, refer back to kind of let's say this particular tip and that's what kind of is established, then maybe those conversations would be easier yeah. for myself and for others, right? Yeah, and I noticed now uh, I didn't see this initially, but you have uh, on the in the footer of goodui.org, you have a place to receive an email newsletter. But then on the bottom right hand side, you have a, a link that says "Improve your site," and you click that, <laughs> and it takes you to Lenowski. What? Uh, sorry, Lenowski.ca. Mm -hmm. What's been the? Uh, has that been a good driver for traffic and people? buying those two services from you? So that's something I think I incorporated. Uh, I've been, I guess, playing around with, like, uh, I think that one I, I introduced maybe a week ago. Uh, I can't say I got anything in the last week out of it, uh, but it's definitely driving traffic, and I did, I have to say that I, I did get a couple leads, uh, successful leads from uh, from the good UI side. Um, so it's definitely, it's, it's definitely something that builds credibility, um, I guess, builds a perception of expertise. Um, and it's, I, I see definitely, uh, I, I do see products and services being attached to, to that site and uh, as, a, as a business strategy for myself. And so you were really saying, this is an experiment. I'm going to put this out and, you know, see how people respond but also hopefully have people try these things and validate some of these hypotheses that I have. Right, right, right. So it's uh, my gut feel. I mean, the, the way the, the way they're set up is, is kind of intuitively, uh, you know, you have version kind of recommendation A over over B, and I and I'm feeling intuitively that A is, you know, better, and there's some some rationale over it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they're pretty much set up for uh, for A/B testing, right? And, and yeah. for and that's kind of. That's kind of also, I think, my, my business strategy, which is something I'm trying to get into, is to move more and more to conversion optimization. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
I'm surprised that no one, like none of the A-B testing suites have approached you to sponsor the site. Not yet. <laughs> um, so how did, because this, this thing got really popular. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell us about how you launched it and promoted it? So when I first uh, launched it, I, I think in, again, I can't remember, March or April, uh, what I used to kick off um, you know the site and, and the visibility of the site was uh, was another bla blog platform um, that I ran uh, called Wireframes Magazine. Okay. With uh, with a couple with a couple thousand subscribers, I guess, and that was enough to to spark off the, the kind of conversation and, and send it out. So I did I did do a post uh, on on there uh, referencing the, the the new project, um, and then. Um, and then over time, I guess, um, uh, over time, there's spikes of, uh, of, of inflow of, of people, right? Mm -hmm. and, and some of the more kind of prominent spikes were from uh, Smashing Magazine, just doing tweets. I think they did three tweets over a course of a couple months. Yeah. Right? And uh, those were pretty, uh, pretty big. Uh, and then also Hacker News is another prominent one, right? Mm -hmm. Um a bit of a funny story behind Hacker News is once I actually initially I actually tried to uh, to uh, to do a post on Hacker News myself and saying hey everyone check out this new project uh, it has some tips for you and if you look at that comment I mean there's maybe just one response right and it's just nothing it just died away yeah uh, I just today in the morning I looked at my karma meter from Hacker News I think it's like five or something whatever that means yeah right? yeah <laughs> but then. Uh, uh, I think June, or sorry, July of, of uh, the summer, uh, another person did a post on, on Hacker News. I think uh, the product manager behind Dropbox, and I checked his karma, and I think he has like ten thousand points or whatever that means. So I guess he's more active, right? Yeah. And yeah. that thing just exploded, and, and over a hundred different comments and discussions, and and uh, you know, as I was as I was on, on vacation this summer. Without access to uh, like being able to kind of comment on and respond to this, mm -hmm. uh, I just was reading all these comments about like people trashing the site and then <laughs> constructively deconstructing and, and arguing in a in a very interesting way. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the one of the things that that stirred the discussion was actually people were a little bit pissed off by the uh, uh, by the fat big footer. Mm -hmm. uh, at, the, at the bottom of the screen, which I think in certain cases, in mobile maybe cases, they took up quite a bit of space. Yeah. Uh, so people were really debating that, you know, what was this good UI guy doing and, and has this terrible footer at the bottom, right? Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, the, the discussion on, on Hacker News uh, sent a couple, uh, quite a bit of traffic and yeah. subscribers. So. Yeah. And we can talk about the footer in a second. Um, you know, that's funny that that I actually wrote a book about this called Amplification. And uh, I've had quite a few uh, things that have gone number one on Hacker News. But that thing you just described about trying to post it once and it getting no response and then someone else trying again mm -hmm. uh, is, is actually quite common. And it shows you actually how, uh, how much timing can play into some of these things. Uh, and there's other variables as well, um, like there there might be uh, a lot of people following that certain person on Hacker News, and that mm -hmm. might have provided an initial kind of uh, bump, but a lot of it has to do with timing, and uh, sometimes you can post something that gets no traction, and I think for people like us that are creators, that can, that can be debilitating, right? You can feel like, oh, well, no one likes my thing, mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> you know... But I think the, the lesson in there is that, you know, a lot of these things do depend on timing and luck and some other factors. And um, just because it didn't get traction one time doesn't mean it won't get traction again. And can you give us an, any idea of how much traffic did you get in that first week and, and since then? Like, what kind of numbers are we talking about? But I would, I would probably guess uh, uh, in the thousands. Okay. In the first week, but then um, I think when I when I once looked at uh, Google Analytics, at one point it had something like eighty thousand page views at its peak. Wow! Um, so that was that was that was probably that week with uh, where kind of oh, sorry sorry uh, the month 
uh, where the Smashing Magazine tweets overlapped with some of the Hacker News stuff. Uh, so it was, uh, it was probably that time when I was kind of on, va- on vacation in Europe and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, just kind of eyeing this. And uh, that's when it kind of blew up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, listening to you, it sounds like you actually didn't promote it that much personally. Is that true? I haven't tried that much, no. It was pretty much uh, the wireframes po- post and the failed attempt on Hacker News. Um, and then it was just taking care of its own, of, of itself. Wow. That's amazing how sometimes things can get just kind of a, become a thing on its own and just gain momentum. So there must have, and there must have been some initial people uh, from the magazine that, you know, that started to spread good UI around and, and, you know, obviously it kind of picked up from there. I think so. I think that was the kind of, you know, the kind of stirring up moment, the initial moment, right? And I think you need that, whether, whether it's your own blog or whether you write a couple guest articles somewhere on something, something more prominent. Um, so that was definitely helpful, right? To, yeah. to, to get the atten- the initial attention. Okay, so let's talk about this infamous footer here um, that you're talking about. So anyone that's listening, if you go to goodui.org, you'll see that uh, there's kind of the first, I don't know, five, six of the page, depending on your browser and your window and all that. But a, a big portion of the page is the actual content, which goes through different ideas for good UI. And at the very bottom is a, a fixed footer where it says receive an update twice a month and then you can enter your email, your name and email address. And uh, this is what Jacob was referring to when he said there's a lot of controversy around that as to whether that was good UI or not. So first of all, Jacob, do you think that's good UI? Why did you put that big fat footer in there? Well, if you look at conversion optimizations and if that was the goal to convert, uh, that was one of the kind of hypotheses I wanted to test was how to get as many people onto this mailing list as quickly as possible, right? Uh, then that I think was a was a clear success. Uh, I don't I don't have like today's numbers in terms of how it converts, but I again I kind of do remember intuitively looking back at it in the first month or two uh, or three, and it was probably a conversion rate of twenty percent. Wow! From, from from the unique visitors, so that was uh, that was I think that was pretty good, right? Um, yeah, that's that's really good. So 20% of unique visitors in the first couple months entered their email address. Yes. Wow. And, I mean, the other thing I I wanted to talk to you about, I mean, I've been doing these interviews. I've interviewed a lot of people. um, And, you know, even you mentioned Nathan Berry and, you know, all these other folks. I don't know anybody that has 26,000 subscribers. Do do you actually have 26,000 people on your email list? I do have twenty six over twenty six thousand people on the list. Yeah, holy <laughs> smokes! Like that is unreal. Like that that's <laughs> that's honestly the biggest list I've heard of. Like of one person just getting on his own. I I would say so. I think footer being one thing, right? I mean, there's a bunch of variables that interplay all together, right? Uh, and the visibility of the call to action is is one thing. Uh, I think a promise. Uh, to deliver content is maybe another thing. Mm. Um, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe it's also. Um, I kind of what I did was I kind of looked back at at Wireframes magazine, something I've done in the past, and then at this project, and I did a bit of a comparison. And uh, both uh, both on both platforms, I, I've used visuals, like a small little kind of image to concise image to display. Uh, to, to visualize uh, an idea, right? So maybe, mm-hmm. maybe that was kind of another factor that that tied into this. Mm-hmm. Um, um, maybe another thing was the fact that it's kind of sketched out. Sketching typically is is uh, so, so there are basically basically a bunch of these kind of sketched out screens, like kind of what you should do, what you should not do, yeah. and they're they're sketched out on purpose because sketching emphasizes. Uh, Get, gets straight to the point and emphasizes the idea very clearly as opposed to going into too much detail. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I wonder if the other thing that this subscription footer has is social proof, right? Because now it says 26,000 plus subscribers. So when you look at that, 
you go, oh, well, this is a big deal, right? This is 26,000 other people have subscribed to this thing. It, it helps kind of motivate you because you can see that there's other people that have already done it. Exactly. So, yeah, social, social, social proof is the other thing that acts, that works in there. Um, very little, not, like very, very small number of fields is probably another tip. Mm-hmm. Uh, initially, I had three fields. I narrowed them down to like f- basically the first name and then last name was separate. And I wrote some JavaScript to combine those into phone name and then s- split them out separate separately on, on, upon submission, right? Yeah. So, so the less fields, the better. Um, I think no commitment and the ability to unsubscribe at any time. I think it's also maybe another thing that that helps. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the, the fact that you can just get out of that at any point in time yeah now that you have this mailing list what's your plan like are what do you what are you going to offer these subscribers right so keep in mind that you know i mentioned that this is an experiment right so i was kind of going into this uh without actually a plan right yeah (laughs) uh but as you can see uh, as you mentioned as well in the the last couple weeks i started pushing products and services onto this right Mm mm-hmm um, you know, every month, of course, it costs to to support this list, and, and there's a, there's a fee that Mailchimp, a nice fee that Mailchimp charges, right? Yeah. Well, how much does um, it cost to send to twenty six thousand? At this point, over two hundred dollars a month. Wow. So, yeah. So this is <laughs> this is costing some money. So it's costing money, right? But yeah. I mean, whatever. It's, it's still a fun experiment, right? So, yeah. Um, and intuitively, like I mentioned, it, it has brought some business. Mm-hmm. So it is a form of content marketing, and I'm, I'm intending to keep going. Uh, to to uh, and, and it's also a learning experience for myself and for others as well. So it's a fun little project. Yeah, and and do you have an idea of what you're going to do next? Like you've been sending right. out tips to people on the list, so you're still sending out good content, right? Mm-hmm. Um, do you have an idea? Like, have some people said? You know, I'd really like it if you wrote a book on this or, you know, what, what are kinds of the, the kind of options you see at this point that you could where you could take this project? Mm-hmm. So there's a bunch of ideas that I'm, I'm kind of circulating and playing around with and, and jotting down notes on. Um, one thought is and it goes back to to that initial idea of validating these things. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, one thought is if I could actually run experiments for each and every one of these kind of ideas that are that are continuously growing and actually have numbers to support these um, maybe there's an opportunity to do a good UI plus or good UI data uh, maybe on a subscription model mm-hmm. and uh, and release kind of metrics and, and true data how well these uh, these things perform um, so there could be so one thought is basically like an alternative a premium, I guess, mailing list with uh, with data to back this up. Yeah, like you said, this there's something about this that grabbed people. What do you think in terms of content? Like you obviously hit a nerve mm-hmm. here. So what can people do in terms of content that might elicit a similar kind of response? Do you think something you can take and apply and and, and use almost like right away? Mm-hmm. Uh, very clear. Maybe it should also be opinionated or have. Uh, I, I, was, I was beginning to wonder that maybe that kind of a bit of that uh, discussion or that kind of polarization. Uh, similarly, as it happened on Hacker News, as people kind of almost like two two sides. Hey, we should do this. We should do that. No, this this is good. This is bad. And they were kind of arguing between each other. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that that was kind of fueling the debate and the discussion. And. I wonder if, if that's something I also have that, that is visible on the site itself with those, you know, try this over that. Maybe that element of, of this versus that is, is, uh, is kind of somewhat kind of, um, you know, stirs, still stirs interest and stirs people's thoughts. Yeah, I think you're right because I think on one hand people look at it and – it gives them something easy to try. They can say, oh, don't do this, do this. And it's something kind of, like you said, you can apply right away. But on the other hand, you're right. Like <laughs> it's going to, it, because you've created an opinion, you've said, you know, I, I think this is right and not this. People, there might be some opposition to that. 
And opposition isn't always bad, is it? Uh, not at all. No, I think it's very constructive, right? And and it, it makes you think, and it challenge you, challenges people, right? Um, have you had any interest? Have has anyone asked you if you would like create some sort of kit to with all the elements you had here, uh, so that people could do this on their own? To do what exactly on their own? To create a page like this. So I'm thinking like. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know the HTML resources and uh, maybe your like Illustrator, uh, you know templates and kind of the whole thing. Just allow people to download kind of a generic kit of this so that they could build something similar. Mm-hmm. So there was one uh, I think comment once made um, something along the lines of, "Hey, these tips are all interesting, but they're all separate from one another." Wouldn't it be cool if uh, well, we kind of released something that amalgamated all these tips into one uniform, almost like a, I'm guessing, almost like a bootstrap HTML framework. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so that was one idea that was thrown uh, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And are, are those the kinds of things that you're thinking about? I mean, have you gotten mm-hmm. a lot of ideas from people saying, man, you should really try this? Or, And has anyone mm-hmm. said, you know, I would pay for you know this kind of this something mm-hmm. inspired by this um there's definitely product ideas that are, are being generated from this right mm-hmm. uh, again the other month or, or so someone mentioned oh this should be uh, done in a poster format or uh, oh this should be uh, there should be a book made out of this right mm-hmm. yeah uh, so so all these I'm, I'm trying to capture yeah and uh and uh, yeah, I'm kind of thinking about <laughs> <laughs> what, what you're going to do next. Yeah. So now you realize you have an audience. Like a lot of people are just trying to build an audience. And now suddenly you have an audience, a big one, like bigger than a lot of people that have been doing this for a long time. And so now you're trying to figure out what to do with this audience. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that's, that's, uh, so, so one thing I think on one hand is, is how to, how to provide and continue to deliver, uh, you know, good quality content, f- f- you know, for, f- for these people. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also how can I extract value for myself? Right. And, and how can I learn, continue, continue to learn and, and uh, like I mentioned, kind of validate some of these thoughts so that they don't just wither away because again, they're all just hypotheses, right? Maybe I'm totally wrong on all that. Right. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, hopefully not. Hopefully not. <laughs> but, uh, um, so yeah, providing I guess you got to balance providing value to to uh, to the people that are listening to you, but also uh, balancing how how to connect and, and use these relationships for for your own goals as well. And because um, now your challenge, it sounds like, is you're saying I've got this broad audience. It's everyone from designers to business people, and mm-hmm. how am I going to offer them something of value? And I think they're interested in. And, and good user interface design, right? And as, mm-hmm. as long as I stick to content, maybe uh, maybe I, get, I need to do a course on, on, on this stuff, right? And, yeah. And, and, and do a, I've been kind of actually eyeing uh, Udemy.com, kind of getting more and more traction recently. Yeah. And thinking about doing something along those lines as well. Yeah, yeah, um, I, think, I think that's a good idea. I, I'm definitely going to have to come back and connect with you again for follow-up to see as you try some of these now business experiments mm-hmm. how how the what the result is you know cuz sure. you had that you kind of have the you have the first part of the funnel which is this you know the big getting the traffic at, at the top of the funnel and now you're getting to the part you're getting probably to the middle part of the funnel where you're trying to figure out you know what what can I offer these folks and pretty soon you're going to be at the end where you're going to say you know how many people actually converted out of my my audience. Exactly. And now I'm on the hook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thanks so much for for coming on and uh and chatting with me, man. There's lots of great stuff here, I think, uh, for our audience. You can check out Jacob on Twitter. He is Jay Lenowski. You can also check out good UI, goodui.org. You can also check out his webpage Lenowski.ca. That's a Canadian uh, domain extension. And uh, Wireframes is wireframes.lenowski.ca, right? Yes. 
Perfect. Well, thanks again for being on the show. Thanks so much, Justin. I appreciate it. Thanks. This is my 50th episode with Product People. I've interviewed over 25 guests and have had over 100,000 downloads over this past year. And uh, now I'm ready to take a break. Uh, I'm going to be retiring the show or semi-retiring the show. It's not going to go away permanently. That feed will stay active and I'll keep adding new shows occasionally. For example, I've got a new show planned with Amy Hoy sometime in the future. But I won't keep producing a new show every week. And this is why. I wanted to stop talking about this stuff and start doing it. I think the most important lesson I've learned from product people is that there's a time for learning. There's also time for action. You have to start doing. In September, I sold my first downloadable product called Amplification. And that same month, I launched something called JFDI.BZ. And uh, that already has 90 paying members. I'd love for you to come and check that out, jfdi.bz. And I'm, I'm just hooked on doing stuff. I will hope you get hooked on doing stuff to the relationships I've built with you and all the listeners are really important to me. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to keep in touch via email. You can subscribe to my email list at justinjackson.ca slash email.html. Thanks again for this incredible ride. Feel free to email me at productpeople at bizbox.ca or hit me up on Twitter at MIJustin. And that's it. The final episode or the final official episode of Product People for a while. Thanks again. Podcast hosting is provided by Transistor.fm. They host our MP3 files, generate our RSS feed, provide us with analytics, and help us distribute the show to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. If you want to start your own podcast or you want to switch to Transistor, go to Transistor.fm slash Justin and get 15% off your first year.